John chapter 14, the words of the Lord Jesus in the upper room, beginning with verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world shall see me no more, but ye shall see me, and because I live, ye also shall live. At that day, then ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, it is he that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. And Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, the other Judas, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come in unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me keepeth not my sayings, and the world which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's whom sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being present with you. But the Comforter, who is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. But the Holy Spirit will bring all these things to your mind. Heavenly Spirit, Gentle Spirit is the name of a song that I'm going to read taken from John 16, 15. The Spirit shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. And the songwriter is written, Heavenly Spirit, Gentle Spirit, O descend on us, we pray. Come console us and control us. Christ most fair to us portray. Here is pleading, interceding, Thou interpreter of love, with thy fire us inspire, holy flame from God above. Come to cheer us, be thou near us, kindle in us heaven's love, keep us burning, humble yearning, dwell in us, O heavenly dove. Pilgrims, strangers, midlife's dangers, we on thee would e'er depend, spirit tender our defender, Guide us, keep us to the end. Marvelous, marvelous words about a marvelous, marvelous person. What the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. In a previous lesson, we introduced the subject of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. We said that He was a person and all the attributes of personality. He was a divine person as shown by the works that he did, or at least the titles that he assumed and the names that he bore. Now this session, the various ministries of the Holy Spirit. And many erroneously believe that the Holy Spirit first came on earth at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and he's going to scoot out of here at the rapture. Both positions are wrong. He certainly did not wait until Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 to come to earth. The truth of the matter is the Holy Spirit had an incredibly profitable and busy ministry in the Old Testament. For the next few sessions, we're going to look at the 11 ministries assigned to the Holy Spirit and described by both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And of these 11, today, this session, we're going to look at three, His ministry concerning the universe, his ministry concerning the Scriptures, His ministry concerning the nation Israel, His ministry concerning the Scriptures. Uh, some time ago, a student uh, approached me and said, you know, I have a problem understanding uh, the works of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in regards to planet Earth. I said, what is your problem? Well, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, 
we are led to believe that the world was created by Jesus, and all things were created by Him. Without Him was not anything created that was created. I said, that's true. But in the Psalms, it indicates the Father created all things. I said, that's true. But in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, Moses says the Holy Spirit created all things. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That's true. Now, here's my question, the students said, and perhaps you've wondered about this. Was it the Father in regards to creation? Was it the Son? Was it the Holy Spirit? And my answer was yes. That is to say, all three had a part. Let me give you a quick uh, illustration. Here is a very rich and important uh, executive, and uh, he decides to build himself a palatial mansion, and he has money to do it. Well, he's not going to do it himself. He's going to get on the phone, and he will then secure the services of a competent architect. And the architect will draw up a set of plans, and uh, the executive will say, hey, looks good to me. Let's do it. And then the contractor or the architect, he's not going to draw that, he's not going to build that house either. He sits behind a desk and he draws up plans. So he's going to get on the phone and he's going to secure the services of a very competent and able contractor. And then this contractor is going to take the plans that were drawn up by the architect and approved by the executive and the contractor is going to build that house. Now, in this illustration, the Father is the executive. In the councils of eternity, he determined to build himself a universe. And he got the best architect he could find, the Lord Jesus. And by the way, that's not just pious preaching, that's Scripture, because in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, Isaiah said that when the Messiah would be born, his name would be called literally, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. Now, did you ever notice the, le the next phrase, why he was called this? The Everlasting Father the Prince of Peace. Why was he called the Everlasting Father? He wasn't the Father, was he? He's the Son. In the Hebrew, the Everlasting Father concept literally means the Father, the architect of the universe. In other words, he drew up the plans. Now, this earth is 93 million miles from the sun. Why isn't it 93,000 or 93 trillion? Well, I don't know why, but I do know one of the reasons. That's the way the architect drew up the plans. So the Father is the executive, the Son is the architect, and the Holy Spirit is a contractor. And here in the second verse in the Bible, we see him with his coat off, his sleeves rolled up, and he's busily creating all things. In six literal days, now he probably was non-union, or I don't know whether he got paid uh, uh, time and a half on uh, the sixth day, but he's creating all things. He's the contractor. So in regards to the Scriptures, he creates what he created, what the Father had approved, and what the Son had drawn up. Now, concerning, well, let me just say this, uh, in uh, sort of uh, detailing this, his first work, that in creating the universe, uh, he created the stars in Psalm 33, verse 6. He created the earth in Genesis 1, verse 12. And uh, he also created uh, vegetation, the trees, Psalm 104, uh, the birds, also in Psalm 104, uh, animals and fish in that same marvelous passage, Psalm 104. It gives us really, you ought to compare Genesis 1 with Psalm 104 because it talks about the creative work and ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. And, of course, he created man also. Uh, Job 33, verse 4, The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. So his work concerning the universe, he created it. Now, his ministry concerning the Scriptures. In a nutshell, the Holy Spirit is the author of the Word of God. And often uh, we will uh, hear arguments concerning who wrote the book of Hebrews. Did Paul write it? Did Barnabas write it? Uh, did Luke write it? Did Silas write it? Did Apollos write it? I know who wrote the book of Hebrews. The Holy Spirit did. Now, I don't know who he chose of those men, but the Holy Spirit is the author of the 66 books in the Bible. And so, in a word, he inspired the hands and the minds and the fingers of 40 human authors, 32 in the Old Testament and 8 or 9 in the New Testament, all 774,000 
747 words in the Bible, all 32,000 plus verses, all 1,189 chapters, all 66 books, all two sections, Old and New Testament, written by the Holy Spirit. Now let's uh, boil this down a little, or narrow it down, I should say. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Old Testament, according to David. At least David thought that the Spirit of God directed him. In 2 Samuel 23, David says right before he dies, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His Word was in my tongue. Now, uh, David wrote at least half of the Psalms, and probably more than that. There are about 30 Psalms that we don't know who wrote, and I have an idea that David wrote most of those, but at least half, and he's testifying here, it was the Spirit of God that directed me in the writing of the 23rd Psalm and many other of the marvelous Psalms that David wrote. And then as uh, according to the testimony of Jeremiah uh, in Jeremiah 1, then the Lord put forth His hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put thy words, my words, in thy mouth. And uh, according to Simon Peter, in one of the great passages on the inspiration of the Scriptures, the source, the Holy Spirit, in 2 Peter 1, 21, for the prophecy, referring to the Old Testament, came not in old time by will of man, so people, uh, group of men just didn't sit down and decide to write a best-selling religious novel, did not come by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now this word moved is a Greek word and it, it refers to a gentle wind, as probably the author, or the, uh, the Greeks that used it had in mind, uh, and the, uh, the Middle East people, uh, the Mediterranean or probably the Sea of Galilee, and here's a group of men wanting to go from east to west or north to south in the Sea of Galilee. And uh, so they'd get out there in their sailboat, and, and then the wind, sometimes it would be very fierce, but often the wind would be very gentle, and it would move the boat from north to south or east or west. And uh, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit of God did. He acted as a divine wind moving upon the very fingers of the, and the hands of the Old Testament authors. And the Apostle Paul, his testimony also, that the Spirit of God was the author of the Old Testament, even though Paul wrote in the New Testament. And Paul writes to Timothy, and Paul says to Timothy, he says, From a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then I think some of the most important words in all the Bible are found in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture, Paul says, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be literally perfectly equipped for every good work. In a nutshell, the Holy Spirit is the author of the Old Testament. Then He's the author of the New Testament also. Jesus Himself would testify to that in John chapter 14. He said, These things have I spoken to you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now here he's predicting that the books that would be written by some of those very disciples would be written at the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. What do we mean? Well, uh, John the Apostle was in that room, and John the Apostle would write, later write the Gospel of John and First and Second and Third John and the book of Revelation. And here Jesus says that He will teach you these things. And Matthew was in that room, and Matthew will write the Gospel of Matthew. And of course, Simon Peter is there, and Simon Peter will later write First Peter and Second Peter. So according to Jesus, the Holy Spirit is the author, not only of the Old Testament, but the New Testament also. And then, according to John, the last book in the Bible, in Revelation chapter 1, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, as it were of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, what thou seest write in a book. And John wrote it down. But the point is that the Spirit of God caught him up, as it were, and instructed him to write the 22 chapters, turns out to be the book 
of Revelation. So his ministry concerning the universe, he created it. His ministry concerning the Word of God, he is the author of the Bible. Now, his ministry concerning the nation Israel. Uh, he came upon Israel's leaders in the Old Testament. No less than 16 Old Testament individuals are said to experience the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Obviously, we won't have time to go through all 16, but just a few here. One of the first instances of this is found in Genesis 41, and uh, it comes from the mouth and the lips, uh, the tongue of an unsaved man, Pharaoh, and he's trying to find someone that will... Uh, that he can assign the duties of taking care of the food supplies of Egypt. And uh, he looks to Joseph, who's just been released from prison. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Now, I'm sure that uh, the Pharaoh had no concept of the Trinity. Oh, there's the blessed Holy Spirit of God living in the bosom of Jesus, or in the bosom of of. Uh, Joseph, as Jesus would predict later. No, he didn't know any of that. But he understood uh, that this man is controlled by the spirit of his God, Yahweh. And certainly Joseph was. And uh, so he came upon Joseph and then upon Moses. In Numbers 11, uh, God, and Moses said, Lord, I need some help. I just can't handle all the people myself. So God said, all right, I will share the presence of the Holy Spirit that I have given you with 70 elders. So Moses did what he did, and those elders would later do what they did because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then the book of Joshua, or actually the man Joshua, in Numbers 27, verse 18, right before his death, God told Moses, you're going to die soon, but you take Joshua, a man is whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. And certainly upon Gideon. God, was, God told Gideon, the angel of the Lord told Gideon to gather an army, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, he blew a trumpet, and he won a victory. So it was upon, in fact, in the book of Judges, often you find the Spirit of God coming upon men. Uh, there's uh, victory, uh, and there's a thrilling thing here, but there's a sad thing also as we look at the life of Samson. At least three times we read of the Holy Spirit coming upon this Hebrew strong man. And the first two times, he, 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 the Spirit of God used him to defeat the enemies of the Lord. But the final time, though, after he got out of the will of God, uh, and uh, someone said took, he uh, got a haircut in the devil's barber shop, uh, Delilah, and she uh, arranged to have his uh, hair cut, and that was the strength uh, of his, uh, that was the source of his strength. And then he awakened, though. She said, Samson, awake, for the Philistines are upon you. And he woke and shook himself as before, and he said, I'll go out and, and clean house here. But the Bible says, the King James says, he wist not, literally, he knew not that the Holy Spirit had departed from him. But he experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. And then David, and often we read of David being controlled by the Spirit. In fact, in 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, when David is anointed as king of Israel, he's still a shepherd, but Samuel anoints him as king. And we read, then Samuel took the horn of oil, and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. David had uh, seven or eight brothers, you remember. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So what we're saying here is that the, in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God came upon Israel's leaders, and uh, he also came upon Israel's elders. And here you have the 17. We talked about that, the elders. He came upon Israel's tabernacle in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. The Shekinah glory cloud of God filled the tabernacle uh, after Moses had completed it. And uh, the Bible says that the presence of the Spirit of God was so overpowering, as it were, that the priest couldn't even function in that tabernacle area for a while. Uh, I uh, would to God that I would live long enough to be in a church service uh, where the Spirit of God was that powerful where uh, there was no need of singing, no need of preaching, no need of rebuking, no need of even reading the Scriptures, but the Spirit of God would take over completely. Uh, to my shame, in all the years that I've been in the ministry and the thousands of churches that I've spoken in, I've never seen that, and I would like to see it uh, before the rapture and or before the hour of my departure from planet Earth. But we read this not only in the tabernacle, but he also 
came upon Israel's temple. Remember, Solomon built the temple, and in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10, and it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. And here we find that this same incredible manifestation of the Spirit of God that was in the tabernacle now in the temple. And uh, well, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe this just doesn't happen today, but I can't believe that because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And if individuals once experienced that incredible power of the Holy Spirit, then it would seem today that if we prayed enough and fasted enough, uh, the same situation, the same blessing would be ours. And then it was the Spirit of God that led Israel through the desert. Unfortunately, tragically, they, they uh, grieved him in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 20. Uh, Thou gavest them also thy good spirit, Nehemiah reminded the priest, to instruct them, and withheldest not thy manna from their mouth, and gavest them water for their thirst. And in the book of Isaiah, in spite of the gracious ministry of the Holy Spirit, we read, But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. How terrible it is to vex the Holy Spirit. Well, those sorry rascals in the Old Testament, before we become too judgmental, Paul wrote to a group of believers in the New Testament, the church at Ephesus, and that church had a tremendous uh, history. It was founded by the Apostle Paul. It was briefly pastored by the Paul, uh, by the Apostle. It was, uh, Paul sent Timothy and Titus to help uh, minister there. Uh, Paulus may have been there. John the Apostle probably was the uh, longtime pastor there, but Paul had to write in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, to the believers there, he said, Grieve not, literally stop grieving the Holy Spirit of God. Well, um, there's nothing new under the sun, and I guess we're all made in the same mold. Some of us are moldier than others, and, and uh, they vexed the Holy Spirit. They grieved Him back then, and God forbid, uh, it's true, but it is, that sometimes we do that today also. Well, He led Israel through the desert, and the Holy Spirit will come upon Israel during uh, the tribulation. In fact, uh, in Joel chapter 2, my spirit will be poured out upon all flesh. Now, I think the ultimate fulfillment of that promise, even though Jesus, or even though Peter quoted it in Acts 2, and he said, uh, this is that which was spoken of by, at Pentecost by Joel the prophet. But I think that's only a partial fulfillment because the passage goes on to say, uh, then the sun will be turned into uh, the blood and the moon, etc., in that terrible day of the Lord. So I think the ultimate coming upon of the Holy Spirit upon Israel uh, is uh, that passage there talks about the tribulation. In Revelation chapter 7, we're told that the Spirit of God sealed 144,000 of Jewish men, 12,000 in each of the 12 tribes. And then the Holy Spirit will come upon Israel during the millennium. It'll take uh, a bloody tribulation for the Jewish people to realize that the man they accused of being filled with the devil of doing the work of Beelzebub, the prince of demons, was indeed the man, the Messiah, that was controlled not by satanic power, but by the direct leadership of the Holy Spirit himself. And uh, we read in Ezekiel 39, verse 29, uh, Neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my Spirit upon the house of Israel. Uh, our prayer at the end of this session is the prayer of Edwin Hatch. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love, and do what thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God, so shall I never die, but live with thee the perfect life of thine eternity. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure, until with thee I will, one will, to do and to endure. 
thus the blessed ministry of the Holy Spirit of God, the third person in the blessed Trinity. Thank you.